Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Well, good morning and welcome to Faith Bridge. It's good to see each of you here today. We're glad you've chosen to worship with us. We are going to be in the book of Philippians. That's about halfway through the New Testament. We're going to be in chapter 3. So if you want to go ahead and turn there, just put your finger on it to hold it for a little bit. If you need a Bible, raise your hands. Our ushers are coming down the aisle. They'll be glad to give you one. And please consider that our gift to you. If you don't presently own one, we'd love for you to take that home and, and begin to read it. Before we jump into the word, let's, let's take a moment and pray together. Father, we're grateful for this day, for your presence in our lives, for the opportunity that we have to, to be in your house. And we pray now that uh, as we turn to your word, the name of Jesus would be lifted up and that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher and guide us into all truth. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. And amen. Deep within the heart of every person is the desire to justify our existence. You know, we, we, we want our lives to, to matter. We want them to count for something. At the end of the day, we want to feel like, yes, there is a reason that I'm here. We, we want to know that life is more than just about making a living. We want to know that there's, there's more to us as individuals than just atoms and molecules, flesh and blood, here today, gone tomorrow. We want to know that we have lived worthful lives, acceptable lives, lives that can be validated and justified. And we go to tremendous lengths in order to do that, in order to get that feeling, in order to have that sense about ourselves. We're gonna be talking about that a good bit here this morning. But for all of our efforts, for all of our desire for this sort of thing, nevertheless, we find that so elusive. When it seems that it's it's just within our grasp, suddenly it's it's out of our reach. And we hope that surely, you know, the the next achievement, the next promotion, the next raise, the next add a boy, add a girl, next uh, feel good about myself is, is gonna land us in that spot where yes, I'm okay. And I have no apologies to make for being me. And I'm just totally at peace with who I am. But I am afraid that Bono, the lead singer for U2, spoke for more of us than he realized when he sang, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. We're on this desperate search. Of course, it's nothing new. It's been around since the beginning of time. Certainly 2,000 years ago, we see it in the Apostle Paul. Just like you and me, Paul was a man who wanted to make his mark. And early in his life, he set his sights on what that mark would be. Paul wanted to be a teacher, but not just any teacher. He wanted to be the perfect teacher. He wanted to be the perfect student of the law. He wanted to live according to the law in every single way, the perfect role model for all who would watch him. In other words, Paul wanted to be a Pharisee. And in Philippians chapter 3, we see Paul working very diligently to prove that he had, in fact, achieved that goal. I'll give you a little context before we start reading. In this chapter, uh, Paul is establishing the fact that nobody worked harder than he did to feel good about himself. Nobody ever put forth more effort to make their mark than the apostle Paul. And so we begin reading in verse four. If someone else thinks that they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness, based on the law, faultless. Faultless. You know, one thing you can say about Paul for sure is he did not have an ego problem. Felt very good about himself. But you know, we can't give Paul too hard of a time because 
you and I engage in the very same pursuit. Now, granted, none of us, so far as I know, have any desire to be a Pharisee nowadays, but we have identified those things in our culture that make us significant, that give us a sense of importance. And we invest energy and time and money, all sorts of resources towards moving in that direction moving to that place where we can finally say, yes, I'm here and I feel good about me. I have a place in this world. I, I've noticed too that the, uh, the lines in which we move down to achieve those things uh, generally fall out uh, on the basis of, of, of gender lines. Now, this is a generalization, I understand, and it doesn't apply to every single individual, but by and large, I have noticed that there are certain set of values and, and pursuits for women and a certain set of values and pursuits for men. And in their individual spheres, there's a question that each sex asks of themselves a question, and the answer to that question makes all the difference in the world in how they're going to feel about who they are. And the question for women is this, am I good enough? Am I good enough? In the, in the crowd that I, I run with, is that the perception that people have of me, that I am good enough? I mean, do, do, I, do I run in the right crowd to begin with? Am I in the right mommy group? Am I in the right social set? And, and then these friends that I have in, in, in this particular group, what do they think of me? I, I wonder, what do they say about me when I'm not there? Is my home nice enough? Is it decorated in a way that can impress other people or at least make them think that I know what I'm doing when it comes to decorating? What about me? Am I skinny enough? Do I wear the right cute clothes that people notice? Does my husband still find me attractive? Or does he find himself looking in other directions? My children, I love them so much, but am I a good mother? Am I good enough? Or am I scarring them in some way that's going to make their life difficult? How are they turning out? Are they good enough? Are they smart enough? Are they athletic enough? Are they pretty enough? Are they accepted in their social group? Are they going to get into the right college? I wonder, ladies, in your quieter moments, perhaps when you're driving by yourself, or maybe when you're lying in bed just before you drift off to sleep, how much space in your heart do these sorts of questions take up? How much real estate in your heart do these questions occupy? Gentlemen, we have our own questions. The primary one for us is, am I important enough? Am I making my mark? Do, do my peers perceive me to be one who is accomplished, who's going somewhere? Am I developing a reputation as a go-to sort of person? When I walk in the room, do people perceive about me that, yeah, I've got my act together and good things are happening in my life and I'm putting forth the effort that is necessary and I'm earning that right reputation? Am I a good provider for my kids? Are, are they able to do the things that the other kids get to do? Are they, are they proud of me as their dad, as their provider? Do I have the right toys? Do I drive the right kind of car? Does it communicate something about me? Do I have the right hunting and fishing gear? Do I have the right memberships? Do I have the right clubs? Does my persona say to the world, yes, I'm a man and I'm going somewhere and I am important. Now maybe you've never thought of those particular sets of questions, but I'm relatively sure, in fact, I'm absolutely sure that all of us have some questions like that. And no matter how hard we work to achieve those things and to answer those questions satisfactorily so that 
when we look in the mirror, when we look at those around us, even we look at God, there's this inner sense of, yes, I am acceptable. I am good. We just can't get there. It may not be in the forefront of our mind every single day right when we wake up, but kind of like that perennial Houston mosquito that just constantly buzzing around, we just can't quite grab that thing. Those questions dance in and out all throughout the day, throughout the week. And we're thankful if we think about it that those thoughts can't be broadcast for the whole world to see, but that we can keep them right here between our ears. We work hard. In fact, if it weren't so sad at how we expend so much time and energy and hope moving towards that kind of validation, if it weren't so sad, it would almost be funny. But it's not funny. And it doesn't lead to a joyful life. I can tell you that from experience. You see, pastors uh, can be among the worst when it comes to, to sizing each other up, to pigeonholing one another, to sort of taking the measure of the other individual. I remember when I graduated from seminary, now close to 30 years ago, it didn't take me long. Nobody ever said this out loud. It was, it was unspoken, it was unwritten. But it didn't take me long for me to figure out that if you want to be a real pastor, you've got to be a senior pastor. I mean, you know, being an associate or being a staff member, sure, that's... That's honorable, but uh, let's be honest. I mean, it's B team, it's Bush League. And if you want to be an even more real pastor, not just a senior pastor, but a church planting senior pastor, I mean, you know, those are the trailblazers. Those are the guys who are, and ladies who are making it happen out there. That's what you should aspire to. Well, my goodness, I didn't want to be second string. I didn't want anybody to think less of me. And so I bought into that notion, hook, line, and sinker. Looking back on it now, many, many years later, I can see the foolishness of it all quite clearly, but then I could not. No, my self-worth as an individual with my peers and with God was hanging on this ability to fulfill a certain role to be a senior pastor, to be a church planting senior pastor. And so I did what I had to do in order to get there. And lo and behold, in 1997, I embarked on that task. And I hated almost every minute of it. I didn't have the requisite skills to do that. That wasn't how God had wired me or gifted me. That wasn't what he was calling me to. But I was so preoccupied with wanting to make my mark and wanting the world to know that I mattered, that I was significant, that I was acceptable, I just forged right ahead at my own peril. It is no way to live. But the good news, my friends, is we don't have to live that way. Paul discovered, despite the fact that he had achieved, it wasn't good enough. But he found something else that was so much better. Picking up then, in verse 7, he writes, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead." In so many words, Paul is saying, listen, folks, uh, I've been to the top of the hill. I've accomplished, I've achieved, and take it from me, it's not all that it's cracked up to be. As a matter of fact, when I look at it 
from the place I stand now in Christ, I can see it for what it really is. It's garbage. The things that you're so desperately putting yourself through to make yourself a worthwhile human being, it's an illusion. It's a trash heap. It will not amount to anything. But I found something so much better. No, I have found my worth, my acceptability, my forgiveness for my mistakes. I have found true life, not in myself, not in anything that I could do, not in anything that the law, which I have studied so diligently, requires me to do, but in my relationship with him. I am good enough, not because I'm so good, but because he's good enough. I am important enough, not because I'm so important, but because he is so important. Paul discovered firsthand, striving doesn't work. Diligence doesn't work. Our efforts don't work. We will never make ourselves fully acceptable to ourselves, to the world, to God on our own. We simply weren't equipped to do that. And all of our striving is futile. And that's why Jesus comes to each one of us and says, quit striving. Quit working yourself to death to do something that you can't do. That's why he said in John 10, 10, I've come that you might have life and have it in all of its abundance. I am life. And it's only as you and I enter into relationship with him that we find what we are so desperately looking for. I mean, do you know how we got in the mess we're in in the first place? You have to take it all the way back to the very beginning. When God created the first man and the first woman, he had such high hopes, such high hopes that as a race, we would exist in perfect fellowship with him, looking to him for our every need, looking to him for our worth and our validation, acknowledging him as almighty God and never to ourselves or our accomplishments. He so desired that and was more than willing to give it to us but he wasn't gonna force it on us. He gave us the choice. And he made it quite plain to Adam and Eve. He said, look, if you will stay connected to me, you will have life. But if you choose to go your own way, you just need to know it's a one-way ticket to death. Well, Adam and Eve, of course, chose the latter. And we've been dealing with the consequences ever since. And each and every one of us have made that decision to go our own way, to do our own thing, to prove ourselves to ourselves, to the world, and to God. And all we wind up with is disappointment and failure and an inability to have what it is we so desperately desire. But God wasn't willing to give up on us even though we turned our back on him and went our own way. No, he loved us too much. And so he came after us. He sent his son, Jesus. He sent his son, Jesus, who would come and open the way for us to go back to God. And the way that he did that was he lived a life that we could never, ever hope to live. And then he stood before the father and said, Father, they can't make it. Not on their own, but I can do it for them. I'll, I'll pay that penalty. And he willingly went to the cross for you and for me to pay something that we could never hope to pay, to do something that we could never hope to do. He secured our acceptability, our worthwhile, our standing before God. He secured all of those things in his death and then three days later, even better, he came back from the dead. That's what we call Easter. What we're getting excited to celebrate here in a few weeks. That Jesus didn't just die. No, not only did he pay the price and do the things that we couldn't do, he came back. And he's inviting each and every one of us who want it to enter into a relationship with him. And to begin to find the things that we want in him and not in ourselves. 
He's wanting to open our eyes to the truth. Now, here's something I know, just as sure as I'm standing here. There are some people here today who are hearing this perhaps for the first time, or or maybe you've heard it before, but for whatever reason, your ears are open today. I don't believe for a second that you're here by mistake. No, I would call it a divine appointment. I think God has brought you here to hear these words so that you can discover for yourself, I can lay it down. I don't have to do this anymore. God loves me. God has reached out to me and I can find my acceptability in him. Don't let this opportunity go by to enter into that. You have nothing to gain by passing it by and everything to lose. Paul said, I want to know Jesus and I want to know his power and the power of the resurrection. In other words, I want to live a life that's beyond me and I can only find that in Jesus and that's what Jesus wants for you today. And in just a little while, we're going to pray and if that's you, If your eyes are being opened for the first time today, I want to give you an opportunity to act on that and let Jesus come into your life and begin to give you what you could never, ever develop on your own. Here's one other thing that I know. There are some of us here today who do know Jesus. We've been in that relationship But for whatever reason, we just can't quite let go of that pull to validate ourselves. We keep being drawn back to it over and over. And even though Jesus has said, I love you, I accept you, I forgive you, still, it's kind of like we're hedging our bets. I mean, okay, Jesus, thanks for that. But on the off chance that it doesn't work, here, I'm going to hold on to this. And I'm going to show everybody how great I am by my job or my appearance or my relationships or my possessions or you fill in the blank. We want to hold on to Jesus with one hand and hold on to the world with the other. But Jesus doesn't share. Especially when it comes to our souls. They are too important to him. And he paid too high of a price for them to let us be deceived into thinking that we can live this way. No, there's only one way to be in a relationship with Jesus, and that's with both hands. That's where we surrender what we think we can do for ourselves. We surrender what we think the world can do for us, and we say, I'm going to trust you. And I know it's scary, And I know the prospect of it for some of you, even as you hear these words right now, is a big swallow and an inner thought, I don't know that I could do that. I've invested so much in these other things. I mean, what might Jesus do with those things if I let them go? I'll be honest with you. That's his prerogative. He gets to decide but you will never, ever, ever regret it. I can tell you that on the basis of the authority of God's word, and I can tell you that based on my own experience. You see, I, I was living this life. I knew Jesus. I was serving Jesus. I was a pastor. But I couldn't find my worth in him. No, I was so fixated on what everybody else thought about me that I'm, I'm holding on to this ball and chain called a church plant and a senior pastor, and it was killing me. After five years, I was physically exhausted, emotionally exhausted, spiraling really down into some depression, truth be told. But through a series of events that I don't have time to go into this morning, God opened my eyes and helped me see, Dan, this this is no way to live. I want you to turn to me with both hands because I'm here for you. And by his grace, I was able to do it. I was able to let go and say, "I I don't have 
to be a church planner. I don't have to be a senior pastor. I don't have to be anything except available to Jesus. And he showed himself faithful to me. When I stepped out of that church planning role, not really knowing what might be next, it wasn't long until I was in a conversation with my dear friend, Ken Warline, who was doing exactly what God had called him to do, plan a church, this church called Faith Bridge. And he said, hey man, th th this thing's taken off. And I, I could really use some help. What would you think about moving out here to, to Texas from Atlanta, Georgia to join me? I remember as Becky and I were going to bed that night, we're both native Georgians, lived there our whole lives. I said, honey, what, what would you think about moving to Texas? She said, I hope you have a good time. <laughs> so, well, honey, would, could we at least pray about it? And we did. We prayed about it for a whole year. And every month, there was a new green light. Dan, this is what I want you to do. And so we made the move. And we came on out here. That was 16 years ago. And I can tell you without reservation, these have been the most satisfying, fulfilling, meaningful, purposeful years of my life. Not just in ministry, though that has been important, but in the life of my family. I'm so thankful that my girls have grown up at Faith Bridge that they've come through the kids' ministry, that they've been on the road, that they've come to know Jesus through the ministry of this church. And almost as a big bonus, icing on the cake, Jesus has given me an opportunity to preach to thousands more people than I ever would have as a church planner, to travel around the world telling people about Jesus in places I never dreamed I would go, to have a part in helping with the planting of 5,000 house churches in India never entered my mind. I'm here to tell you today, friends, God is good and God loves you and he's ready for you to step off of that treadmill. He's ready for you to let go and take a hold of him. So let's don't waste any more time. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for loving us enough to come after us in our foolishness and in our so-called wisdom. We walked away, but you loved us too much to let us go. If you're one of those persons I was talking about a few minutes ago who you're hearing this for the first time, I wanna give you a simple prayer to pray so that you can begin that relationship. All you have to do is say, Father, I agree with you that I've gone about this the wrong way and that I've tried to validate myself. But today I want to receive your love and your forgiveness and your validation. Today, I want to know your son, Jesus. If you prayed that, you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that not only did he hear you, but that Jesus is with you now. And Jesus will begin to fill your life with a love and an acceptance and a validation that you could never find on your own. And if you're in that other crowd that knows Jesus but just can't quite let go, I know what that's like and I, I can pray with you because the tug is still there. Lord, forgive us for thinking that the foolish things of this world would ever add value to our lives. We look to you. We confess to you, Lord, that we looked the wrong way, but today we're looking back and we're taking hold of you with both hands and we're praying, oh God, you would receive us and fill us once again with the knowledge that you are all that we need. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for this time. And we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to Postscript. 
Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Well, welcome to Postscript. My name is Michael Sullivan, business administrator here at FaithBridge, and I'm joined by Dan Slagle, our care and bridging pastor, who just brought us part four of our Joyful series on a message called Joy Through Surrender. Thanks for being here, Dan. You bet. It's a great message today. I think it really met people right where they were at, and we had a lot of questions that came in because of it. Okay. So let's get going. Uh, the first question, I think it's a really great one, is... You were talking about uh, ambition and uh, things like that, and somebody said, well, how will I know if my ambitions are in the wrong place? Will God send me a stop sign, or how do I know if, if my ambitions are in the wrong place? Yeah, that's a great question to ask. <clears throat> um, God doesn't usually communicate quite so explicitly. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would um, take a a multifaceted approach. First thing I would do is examine my heart and my overall walk with the Lord. Hmm. Uh, am, am I in good fellowship with Him right now? Honestly, you know, mm -hmm. meeting with Him in the Word, praying. Uh, am I involved in a local body uh, for purposes of correction and, and growth and those kind of things? Mm -hmm. uh, if, if all of that is in good shape, then we can sort of begin to narrow the focus a mm -hmm. little bit. Uh, we can begin to ask ourselves, you know, what, what is my motive for doing this? Mm -hmm. uh, when I think about this opportunity, it, what is the first thing that comes to my mind? Is it to increase my bank account, <clears throat> to make a name for myself? Mm -hmm. a am I at the top here or am I thinking in terms of bringing glory mm -hmm. to Him? Uh, Subjectively th speaking, I, I think there's something to be said for uh, inner peace or a, a lack thereof. Mm -hmm. If every time you're involved in, in this, something's not right, that, that's probably a pretty good indicator of the Holy Spirit's saying, oh. um, I would definitely seek the wisdom of others to double check. I, we can deceive ourselves so easily. Mm -hmm. So being a part of a local body and perhaps uh, even better, a grow group mm -hmm. of people who know us, uh, that we trust, who can speak truth into our lives. A, a combination of all of those things, I think, can work together to help us gain a clear picture. Yeah, that's really helpful. Uh, and I think you're yeah. right. The, the wisdom of the counsel of many is Amen. so helpful, especially in trying to discern what is God saying to me. So that's good. Thank you. Uh, maybe a second question that came in was you, you kind of mentioned in your sermon um, that there were some personal steps that you took, but that you didn't have time necessarily to, to dive into all of that in the sermon. Why don't you take us through? What were some of the <laughs> steps that you took uh, to really get your focus back onto God and um, away from some of the, the church planning stuff that, that you talked about. Sure. Well, the, one of the first things that I did was go and seek some help. Hmm. Uh, I knew I was not in a good place, certainly not the ideal place hmm. for ministry. <laughs> Excuse me. And so I went to <clears throat> some older, more seasoned uh, pastors and believers and just told my story honestly. Hmm. Another thing that I did and I, I'm going to chalk this up to divine inspiration. I sat down and made a list of the 20 people that I felt like knew me the best in the whole world hmm. and really had nothing to gain or lose in their relationship with me. They just knew me. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a letter to each one <clears throat> describing where I was, hmm. asking them, you know, what gifts have you seen in me honestly? And <clears throat> does this strike you as a fit or... Uh, is my misery index here purely self-inflicted mm -hmm. or is God using this? <laughs> and every one of them wrote me back. Really? Yeah, every single one. Wow. And I got such tremendous guidance from that. Just, just a lot of help. Becky, of course, was tremendously mm -hmm. helpful in that whole process. <clears throat> so if I were to point to anything, I would, I would say <clears throat> humbling myself enough 
to seek the wisdom of others. Mm. You know, we, we are loath to admit failure, mm. especially if it's something that's relatively high profile, at least for us. Mm-hmm. It's hard to go to someone and say, this isn't working. <clears throat> what do you think? Yeah. But that, that honestly was the key. Those are the things that God used. Uh, those people were able not only to impart their own wisdom, but they recommended good books for me to read. Mm. Uh, I remember I wound up getting connected to a particular counselor I would not have found otherwise who gave me a lot of guidance. So the body of Christ really came through. And it's so helpful when you have multiple people speaking in because you typically do see themes of uh, we really see this in you or um, maybe you hear the same name of a counselor over and over or something like that is extremely beneficial. Well, that's helpful. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, switching gears just a little bit, uh, the generosity moment that we had yeah. today was highlighting India, which we just returned from, had the opportunity to go uh, with Hope for Today and mm-hmm. go over there and train some pastors and some church planners ourselves. So uh, maybe want to share each of us a high point of the trip or something that yeah. God really encouraged you with over there? Sure. Um, <clears throat> Honestly, Sully, the the high point of the trip for me was the opportunity to do ministry with you. Hmm. Uh, It was just a lot of fun to go together and enjoy that culture, but also to see the impact that you're making in the lives of those people. I saw a lot of appreciation on their part, um, just a lot of gratitude for for what you brought to the table. And, you know, (laughs) as the older guy, it it warmed my heart to see you... moving onward and upward in what God has has for you to do. Well, I appreciate that. It was a a great trip. I really, every time I go over there, I'm so challenged by their faith. Mm -hmm. I mean, these people are dealing with some tough stuff. I mean, persecution is no joke. I mean, you were uh, even sharing with our staff this week, the guy who lifted up his shirt and said, here's the stab marks that uh, are real. And I was... Uh, meeting with two pastors um, right there from Kerala who were wanting uh, to just build a church and the government had shut that down. Mm. And so I was so inspired by this man and we talked about this. Um, He and his wife just said, well, the church has got to be somewhere. Can't be here. Why not our house? And so they retrofitted their house so that 35 people could come and gather on a weekly basis. I mean, it just was... Such commitment. Yes. Uh, and, you know, it really challenged you to, to say and ask of yourself, you know, what what commitment do I have to the Lord even here? And Amen. so um, just a great trip. Uh, always inspiring, always encouraging. So thankful to be a part of that ministry. And, and just the effect they're making. I mean, 5,000 churches planted Blows my since mind. 2009. Every time. It's really amazing. So God's doing a good work there. And God's doing a good work here at Faithbridge. Love the stuff he's doing. So thanks for going to India together, and thanks for being here today at PostScript. Sure. We thank you guys for joining us. We'll see you back next week as Ken is going to come and round out our joyful series. So we'll see you back next week. Thanks for joining us for PostScript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.